All right, so we're gonna work on integrating exponentials. Now, we have already been dealing with the antiderivative of e to the x equals e to the x, but we have not dealt with the antiderivative of two to the x or the antiderivative of eight to the x. So that's kind of what we're gonna get into today. And we'll also do some um, problems that are kind of messy that do just involve e to the x. So let me remind you where we've been, okay? So we know that y equals e to the x means y prime equals e to the x. Remember how we developed the derivative of two to the x. So we said y equals two to the x and what we're wanting is y prime. But we took this exponential form of the equation and first rewrote it in the logarithmic form of the equation. We did implicit differentiation. So the derivative of x is one. The derivative of log base two of y is one over y ln two, okay, times y prime, that's, that's using chain rule. Multiply everything by y ln two. So y ln two equals y prime. Y prime is what we want. We don't want y prime with y's in it. So remember, replace the y with two to the x. So y prime equals two to the x ln two. Ah, okay, so that gives us the formula that d dx of um, two to the x equals two to the x times ln two. So does it make sense to you then that the antiderivative of two to the x equals two to the x, not times ln two, but it would be divided by ln two. And of course, plus the ever popular plus c. Mm, now, if you're still saying, I'm not sure that makes complete sense, then remember, if you take the derivative of your answer, you should get back to the original integrand. So if I did that, I would say the derivative of my answer, two to the x divided by ln two equals the derivative of this part. So let me say, um, let me say I wanna do d dx of one over ln two times two to the x. I think that's gonna be an easier way to put it. Plus the derivative of c, c is just a number. So the derivative of c is just zero. Now when I take the derivative of this, I just say, well, that's my plain number times the derivative of the two to the x part and the derivative of two to the x is two to the x ln two. Oh, so the ln twos cancel and you get two to the x. Since that matches the original integrand, then I know that this formula for the antiderivative of two to the x was correct. So now you know what the derivative, antiderivative rule is. Let's show some, let's work some problems with it. All right, so here are some problems that require some, some basic use substitution with our new antiderivative rules. So on this first one, <clears throat> I recognize that I have the two to the u construct. So Generally, on problems like this, if you see part that's exponential, this is the part that is a composite function, and the inside function is the exponent. And then the derivative of sine x is cosine x dx. So I take my original problem, I rewrite <clears throat> the two to the sine x is two to the u, and then I rewrite the cosine x dx as du, I just learned that the antiderivative of two to the u is two to the u divided by ln two plus c. My final answer is supposed to have x's in it, so it would be two to the sine x over ln two plus c. The good news on is on these, usually if they do put these on the AP exam or the CLEP exam, they don't go real crazy with what your user is supposed to be. They keep it pretty straightforward. 
they'll do a little bit messier problems with the e to the x because the antiderivative rule is simpler, so they'll make the u sometimes more complex. All right, so this is a similar problem. So I'm asking you to solve a differential equation generally, which means you've got a plus C in your answer. So remember, the answer for a, an, a differential equation is an equation Y equals or F of X equals. So the first thing I need to do is separate variables, meaning I need to get my Y's on one side, and all my x's on the other. We're gonna go into a section of solving differential equations um, with separation of variables. And so I'm just showing you some small ones up front. So when you get to the big ones, you've already kind of got an idea in your head about how they proceed. So now we do the antiderivative of both sides. The antiderivative of one is gonna be just y. On the other side, I've got a problem that looks kind of like what I had over here. Do you recognize that what I need to do, let me make room, I'm gonna erase this. Do you recognize then that if I generally let you be my exponent, then du is going to be negative four x cubed dx. Okay, so let me see here. At this point, I've got five to the u, I think this two, I'm gonna to pull to the front so it doesn't convolute the issue here. So then I would still have the x cubed dx to deal with. Oh, well here I could replace x cubed du or x cubed dx, my bad. I can replace the x cubed dx if I make it negative one fourth du. I don't like the negative one fourth here. So let me put negative one fourth to the front and then just make it du. Now I'm making progress. So y is going to be negative one half times the antiderivative of five to the u is five to the u over ln five plus c. And remember, I need to say, oh yeah, and u was negative x to the fourth and then I've got it, okay? So you might see it like a negative five to the negative x to the fourth over two ln five, but otherwise you should be able to piece together that that's the same sort of answer. Now, as I mentioned, most of the time, if they want you to anti-differentiate an a to the x, dx problem. If they don't just give you like two to the x, three to the x, four to the x, then a lot of times what they'll give you is a very, very slight um, alteration where instead of x, it's negative x. Or they might give you a to the two x dx. Or they might give you a to the one third x dx. But a lot of times they'll just give you um, a U substitution, which is linear. And so if we could work on getting you to the point where you don't have to go through the U substitution, but you can just kind of compensate and move on, that will be really helpful um, for what we're going to start next week, um, which is called tabular integration, which you're going to like. Um, you're going to wind up being really super good at it, and you're not going to think it's difficult. So that's kind of cool. That's coming. So anyway, I see that I've got that going on here because instead of just X, I've got negative X. Here, instead of just saying X, I have one half X. So those are both very easy um, alterations. So if I wanna do this, remember, I go ahead and do the antiderivative of X squared, like normal. And then I've gotta deal with the antiderivative of the exponential separately. So when I do this, if I do a U sub, it only applies to this part. It doesn't retroactively somehow go back and, and apply to this. So just for the part I've still left to integrate, U is gonna be negative X 
So du is just negative dx. So I've got here three to the u, the dx simply becomes negative du. So this is going to be negative three to the u over ln three plus c. The u becomes negative x again. Oh, and then I've still got that one third x cubed that I tag onto the front of it. Okay, in a similar way <clears throat> over here, if I said u equals x over two or one half x, du becomes one half dx. And so for just a minute, let's suppose that this is not a definite integral, it's indefinite. My structure would then be six to the u and then dx gets replaced with two du. And then I would say, okay, that's two times um, six to the u ln u or ln six plus c if it were indefinite, where the u would get replaced with one half x. So what I wanna show you is, notice if I have a negative x, I compensate with a negative and probably what I do is instead of saying plus a negative, I just say minus. If my u is one half x, I compensate with a times two. So you could start to do that more quickly. And I'll say something about that. Let's go back and finish this problem and then I'll show you what I mean really quickly here. So we'll, we'll start to kind of drill down to what I'm trying to get you to see. On this one though, because it is, um, an indefinite integral or a definite integral, we have to say, oh, okay, that's a high X and a low X. From there, let me spring forward and get a high U and a low U. So plug in your high X. So one half of two is one, that becomes your high U. Plug in your low X, which is one. So half of one is, is half. That becomes your low U. So the antiderivative of six to the u is six to the u over ln six. And I'm gonna go from one to one half. Now I'm gonna move the ln six out. So it's two over ln six. And then I'm gonna say six to the one minus six to the one half. So that gives me two ln six times six minus square root of six. So you're likely to see this as two times six minus the square root of six all over ln six as a final answer. You get sometimes some weird answers like that, okay? Um, but let me go back to what I was saying with the quick compensation of the exponents. And if you can get to where you can skip some steps, I think you'll ultimately be happier. So if I said, well, what about four to the negative x dx? Or what about seven to the two x dx? Or what about, um, we'll say 13 to the one third x dx? If you can say, well, this is going to be four to the negative x over ln four, plus C, and since my exponent's negative, I'll compensate with a negative. Well, this is going to be seven to the two X over LN seven plus C. Since my exponent was two X, I need to compensate with a one half times. You might be going, what? If U is two X, DU is two DX, and the dx part becomes one half du, this half is here. So it's if you've got um, the u part is ax plus b, it's linear, then the du part is a dx. The dx part then becomes one over a du. The one over a is how you compensate for it. And here, I would say, okay, so it's gonna be 13 to the one third X 
over ln 13 plus C. And since I have one third as the coefficient, I compensate with it with a three. So again, if u is one third x or one third x plus you know, five or one third x minus four, whatever it is, du is one third dx and dx becomes three du. So this three is what I'm putting there. That'll just move you along a little bit faster, especially next week when we get into tabular integration. So let's do two final problems. But on these, I'm going to get away from just a minute from doing an a to the x and go back to e to the x problems because the um, antiderivative of e to the x is simpler, but sometimes the questions they ask as a result are more difficult. So let's solve a differential equation with a particular solution. And I know it's a particular solution because they're giving you initial conditions which means instead of plus C, I can plug in and find actual numbers. So I want, if this is my differential equation, F double prime of X equals, I'm done when I get an F of X equals. So remember the solution to a differential equation is an equation in the Y equals or the F of X equals format. So my first thing is if I take the antiderivative, so to speak, of both sides, I don't have a dx out here, so this is kind of an implied process. But the antiderivative of f double prime is just f prime because I'm working my way up back up the ladder. Sorry, there we go. We're back into focus. The antiderivative of sine x is negative cosine x because remember, you've got to take um, the derivative of cosine gives you negative sine. So the derivative of negative cosine gives you positive sine. Now let's use what we did a second ago. I know the antiderivative of e to the 2x is going to have an e to the 2x in the answer, but I have to compensate since this is 2, I'll have to compensate with a 1 half there. And if you're not quite sure what I did, actually write down u equals 2x, u du equals 2 dx, dx equals 1 half du, and you'll see it for yourself. And then I'm going to play, say plus C1. Why am I saying plus C1? Because I know that I'm going to have to do the antiderivative again to get from F prime up to F, which means I'm going to have a second constant. Okay. So I think it's easier to call them C1 and C2, or you can call this one C and the next one D or some other letter. So at this point, I don't want C1. Well, I'm working with F prime of X. So I need to work with my initial condition that has something to do with F prime. So that would be this one. That tells me to plug in X equals zero and um, F prime equals one half. That's essentially, I've kind of written it in a not so great way, but that's what's going on. So in place of F prime, I'm gonna plug in the one half. In place of x, I'm going to plug in 0. So 1 half equals cosine 0 is 1. So this turns out negative 1. This will be e to the 0, which is 1. So it's 1 half times 1 there plus c1. So 1 half equals negative 1 plus a half is negative a half. Oh, cool, okay, so C1 is one half plus a half is one. That's cool. So now I've got F prime of X equals negative cosine X plus one half E to the two X plus C1, which I now know is one. So let's hit it again with anti-differentiation. So the antiderivative of F prime is F, and that's what I want. The antiderivative of cosine x. I would have to take the derivative of negative sine x to get negative cosine x. Now, I would have to take the derivative of e to the 2x and multiply by another one half. 
So remember, I've already done the, deri the antiderivative of e to the 2x once, and I got one half e to the 2x. So it's this times the one half I already had. The derivative of one is x plus c2. Now, since I've got f of x, use your initial condition for f of x. So this says plug in x equals zero and f of x equals one fourth. So I'm going to say f of x becomes one fourth. Negative sine x becomes negative sine of zero plus um, one fourth e to the two times zero plus zero plus c2. Sine of zero is zero anyway, so this zeroes out. This becomes just one fourth plus zero plus C2. Well, that looks like C2 then is gonna be one fourth minus one fourth is zero. So now I know if I put it all together, that F of X equals negative sine X plus one fourth e to the 2x plus x plus c2 is plus zero. So I, I don't need to write that. I'll just say I'm done right here. So that is the particular solution. And we have one more example. All right, our last example is still, it's just an e to the x problem. But sometimes when you've got this much stuff going on in the integram, people kind of like go, whoa and kind of freak out a little bit. Guys, when I look at this, I notice it's a fraction. It's not your basic polynomials. So trying to do degree on top, degree on bottom is a little, it, it just doesn't quite fit the situation. So when all else fails and I have a fraction and I can't somehow factor really, I'm just gonna say, all right, well, if all else fails, if I don't see some other cool trick, I generally just let the bottom equal u and assume that this might have something to do with a logarithm in the answer. So if I do this, I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed. The derivative of e to the x is e to the, e to the x. The derivative of e to the negative x is e to the negative x times the derivative of negative x, which is negative one. So I'll just say negative one times e to the negative x, and then dx. Well, notice, guys, I've replaced the bottom with u. I still have this e to the x minus e to the negative x dx left. Well, this and this are identical. So instead of writing all this out, let me just go ahead and write du. Thank goodness, it was not as bad as I thought it was. So the message is sometimes just go for it. Just set the bottom equal to you and just hope it works out or you'll see how to, how to manage it. But just do something. Now, this is a definite integral, so I need to figure out what my low and high u's are. So I'm gonna go back to my definition of u. Let me plug in my high x, which is ln four. So it would be e to the ln four minus e to the negative ln four. Now that's gonna be tricky. So e to the ln four is four. On this next thing, I'm gonna to have to be clever. I can't do anything with it being e to the negative. It needs to just be e to the, well guys, I can make this e to the ln of four to the negative one. Well, that's e to the ln four, e to the ln of four to the negative one, which is just gonna be four to the negative one. That's gonna be four minus one fourth. Whoa, I did not see that coming. So 16 fourths minus one fourth is 15 fourths. Boy, you gotta be careful with that. So on the bottom one, my bottom um, x is zero, so I've got to say e to the zero plus e to the negative zero. Oh, thank goodness. That's just one plus one equals two. Whew, that's a little easier. Boy, that top exponent, that was tricky. 
So the antiderivative of one over U is ln of the absolute value of U, 15 fourths and two. So ln, the absolute value of 15 fourths is just 15 fourths, minus ln, the absolute value of two is just two. So now I have to say that that is 15 fourths over two. So remember, this is 15 fourths times a half. So my final answer is ln of 15 eighths. So again, the answers aren't altogether easy. It gets you into some tricky numbers and so forth. So um, you just have to be super careful. If you get hung up on these problems, please meet me in Zoom so I can help you get unhung up, okay? So you've got one more video that really is new stuff, and that's today. It's on the arc trig functions. And then we'll get into mixing, especially mixing where your integrands are fractions. And we'll talk about how you make decisions about which way you handle your fractions. Cause that, that's kind of tough, but we're gonna be working on that next as of tomorrow. Good luck with this guys.